we believe that the Bible teaches the imminent, premillennial return of Christ to take his people to be with him, and to judge and to rule the earth in righteousness. Now we believe in the resurrection of the body for both the believer and the unbeliever. The Bible teaches that the believer does uh, go directly to be with Christ uh, upon his death, immediately after his death, having escaped the condemnation of his sins through the death of Jesus Christ. He will, however, stand before God to receive rewards for the works which God has approved, or he'll suffer the loss of the works which are disapproved. The believer will live eternally in the immediate presence of God, while the unbeliever must face the eternal and the holy judge who will sentence him for his sins. He will experience the punishment of eternal separation in hell from the presence of an almighty God. Now, there are 11 thoughts that I want to discuss with you concerning this. These teachings provide the hope uh, for the future of those who are believers, but it serves as a warning to those who are not believers. Now, the first aspect of the believer's hope, then, is the fact of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This hope is based on Christ's own promise. In John 14, 3, he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And it is further substantiated by many, many other references in the New Testament. I'll just read a couple of to you. One of them from 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Just one more verse on that subject from Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his works. Well, we believe that the Bible teaches that his return is going to be physical and it is going to be bodily. As those two witnesses stood there just after Jesus had ascended into heaven and the disciples and those others that were with him on the Mount of Olives stood there looking up into the clouds watching where Jesus had gone, they came and they made this statement. Uh, they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Well, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. Now this promise of his return was not fulfilled in the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, as some would have us to believe. Nor is it being fulfilled in the coming uh, into the life of each individual believer when the man is born again or converted. Also some teach that. And uh, nor is it the spreading of the gospel throughout the world of this age. That's not the second coming of Christ. He will come physically and bodily just as he left this earth. He will come back again. Now, another aspect of the believer's hope is uh, represented by two descriptive words which help to define the time of Christ's return and what one's attitude should be towards his return. The first word is eminent, which indicates the sudden and unexpected nature of his return. He has, there's nothing waiting for his return. He can come any time now. Now, this truth provides a great incentive to be alert and to be watchful, as well as involved in the work of the Lord. We should be ready, waiting for him. In Matthew 24, Verse 42 and 44 and 46, we have these words. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord will make ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is the servant, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. 
Now the second word is premillennial. That word millennium comes from the word thousand, by which we understand that Christ's return uh, will occur uh, before he sets up his earthly kingdom of righteousness in which he will reign for a thousand years. Now much of that, uh, of that is said in all through the Old Testament. The time element, however, is left to the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, and I shall read uh, that particular portion in the 20th chapter. I'll read beginning with verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word uh, of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither the uh, image, uh, neither uh, taken the mark of the beast in their forehead or in their hand. And they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in this first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years years. That's the prospect that we have. Then in the third place, the return of Christ provides a great hope for the believer. For the scriptures teach that he will take those who are his redeemed people to be with him forever. We've already read the scriptures to you. First in John 14, 3 says, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am ye may be also. And the same thing was mentioned in First Thessalonians, where he will come, and then he says, Shall we ever be with the Lord? Now this event is called the rapture, signifying that God's people will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air when he comes. But there is more included in the matter of the second coming of Christ. The rapture, I believe, is the first thing that shall take place. I believe that that's what the scriptures teach. And then there's much to follow. Now, th this hope then of the Lord's return includes his judging of the present world order and the setting up of his own righteous kingdom on this earth. We go again to the book of Revelation, this time to the 11th chapter. And in verse 15, I'll just read one verse for you there. But the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. Or as we already saw in the 20th uh, chapter of the book of Revelation in verse 4. And he says, When I saw thrones, and them that sat upon them when unto them was given uh, to reign. And he says, They lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. Christ alone has the right to judge and to rule. In the promise that was made uh, unto Mary uh, when uh, the angel came to her and told her that she was to become the mother of Jesus Christ, he said to, the, to Mary these words, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So you see, he is the one that shall reign, Jesus Christ. That's the promise. Therefore, it is not possible for men to establish a complete and just society on this earth. They're trying to, some of them are, and to set up a kingdom of God uh, in its uh, fullness on this earth. That's impossible. Only Jesus, at his second coming, can possibly fulfill this forecast and prophecy concerning uh, the coming uh, rulership and kingdom in this world. In the fifth place, there's another important aspect of the believer's future hope, and that is the resurrection of the body. You see, when a man dies, his soul goes immediately into the presence of the Lord, but his body returns to the dust. But there will be a resurrection of that body. Although the emphasis of Scripture is upon the resurrection of those who are uh, Christ's, uh, but it also speaks of those who are, do not believe. They shall also be raised. Listen to what Daniel has to say in the 12th chapter and the 2nd verse. Many other Scriptures. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, 
and some to everlasting contempt. Well, the guarantee of our future resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself, whose glorified body becomes the model for what we shall be like when we are raised together with him. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, uh, we have this statement. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruit of them that sleep. And verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruit, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. This has to do with the resurrection of the body. Christ now lives in a glorified, resurrected body in the presence of the Lord. We shall have a similar body as that of his, for we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The resurrection of those in Christ will occur then at the time of his return unto this earth. These verses I read to you, I think, will make that very clear from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 20 and 23. Then the scriptures further uh, give a hope uh, to the believer, and that after his death and before the final resurrection, the disembodied soul of the believer goes immediately into the presence of the Lord. There is no such a thing as soul sleep. But from the moment a person dies, his soul goes into the presence of the Lord, even though his body returns to the dust which will be raised on that particular day. Let me just read uh, one scripture to you from Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. But we are confident. I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, the intermediate state between the physical death and the resurrection of the body is then one of blessed consciousness for the believer and freedom from the cares and the sufferings of this world. Philippians 1.23 says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. That was Paul's ambition. Well, another thought. The most encouraging aspect of the believer's hope for the future is that he has been freed from the condemnation of his sins. Through his faith in Christ, he has been released from the penalty of his sins and will never face God as a coming judge. John 5, 24 makes that so clear. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is already passed from death unto life. Now, for part of tomorrow, we will discuss with you uh, several more aspects of this matter of the second coming of Christ. And one of them I just wish to introduce, namely that the Scriptures teach uh, that the believer will be called to give an account before the Lord Jesus Christ, and this of his life after he became, became a Christian, not in the sense of judiciary sentencing, that is, he will not be sentenced for anything that he's done wrong, but rather he will be given rewards or it will be a loss of rewards. Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. Join us again tomorrow as we listen to Theodore Epps' message. God bless you.